These are noises I feel like I need to make inside this car. You join me inside the cabin of the 2020 Dodge Charger Scat Pack Widebody. And this car is a relic. It's a relic of a time when a muscle car was just a muscle car. It didn't need to be as fast as a Ferrari around a racetrack. It just needed to be comfortable, loud, powerful, and BA looking. And that's precisely what the Charger Scat Pack wide body is. And we have to decide whether it's time for the muscle car as we knew it to die. Or if we should just hold on for a few more years. That's today. Ah! And there's the man maker itself. The 2020 Dodge Charger Scat Pack wide body. And boy, what a wide body it is. Now before we get into the exterior walk around, interior walk around, and then driving impressions, couple things. If you have not subscribed to the channel yet, please do so. So you can get access to the daily videos I have for you, the POV drives, the walk arounds, the live Q and A's, and of course the reviews. And if you do not want to hear me speaking anymore, feel free to check out the POV drive or walk around day and night, POV drive, I mean, for this Charger Scat Pack wide body that is up on the channel as we speak. The night drive is coming tomorrow, but everything else is up right now, so you can check those out. If you are a loyal subscriber and would like to support the process of these videos being made and the stupid commentary I deliver, consider becoming a patron. I do have a Patreon for the channel listed in the video description. There's also merch. I'm wearing some of it right now. Miles per hour t-shirts. I'm gonna be making more t-shirts. So look forward to those. And that's the end of my spiel. I've made it around to the front. Let's talk about the Scat Pack widebody. So for 2020, only a couple updates to point out, one of which is right here at the front. So the fascia has been mildly updated with this male slot added between the hood and the front bumper that I think looks pretty darn good. It breaks up the fascia a little bit and provide some more cooling for that 6.4 liter Hemi V8. All of this front venting is functional. I do like that. What did I just say? I do like that. None of this fake stuff that we're seeing on a lot of cars, sports cars and otherwise, this is all functional. You've got a big V8 to cool. You need all the venting you can get. This one over here, channeling air over the front tires to cool those big brakes. Here's where some of your active safety features are hidden. And this one, I'm just gonna get right to it, is painted indigo blue metallic, and it is a fantastic paint color. Right below Destroyer Gray, in my opinion. Destroyer Gray is it for me. If I was gonna go buy this car, I would get it in Destroyer Gray. But if for some reason, the world supply of Destroyer Gray just evaporated, I would go get myself the Indigo, Indigo Blue Metallic. It is gorgeous. Look at it in the sun. Pretty metal flake, deep blue color that transforms in different lighting. It's just a good looking color and is nice with the red accents, the 392 badging, not the reflector on the side. I would paint that black. And the Scat Pack badge with the B on wheels. But yeah, they all just bring out this blue so well. This one also has the dual carbon stripe. So not real carbon fiber, but it's the carbon look and it runs 
nose to tail. And I think looks pretty good. I haven't decided whether I would get the carbon fiber stripe. If I was going to get the destroyer gray, I would just do no stripe. But if I was going to go with this blue, yeah, I'd probably do it. It looks pretty darn good. Also for 2020, you get standard bi xenon headlights, not LEDs, LED daytime running lights, but not LED headlights. This one has the update or upgrade rather for some price I'm going to list here for the HID headlights, high intensity discharge. And then of course you have your hood scoop. Pulling more air into that engine. No supercharger, but still needs a lot of cooling. So that's the front of the Charger Scat Pack. Let's move on to the side where we see first and foremost, because it has the wide body, you've got these massive fender flares. So you just how far they stick out. A ton. But they have to stick out that far because they need to contain these massive wheels and tires. So we've got 20 inch wheels as standard on the wide body, wrapped in Pirelli P0 tires, 305 section at all four corners. So a really solid stance. And I like the gunmetal finish on these wheels. It's actually really funny. The color of the wheels hides all of the brake dust that you will no doubt accumulate. I didn't even bother to clean the front wheels. We can see the rear here, kind of the finish. They don't have brake dust all over them, so they shine if you don't have brake dust. But if you do, it's not the end of the world because they're gunmetal. And you will generate brake dust from these six piston front Brembo brakes, four piston rear, and they're on massive 15.4 inch front rotors, 13 inch rear slotted, so you've got that ventilation that you very much need. Big, big brakes, powerful, same brakes you get on the Hellcat, and they do a job of pulling this 4,300 pound sedan down from insane speeds very, very well. Great tires, plenty of grip. Your 392 Hemi badging, that's 392 cubic inch V8 Hemi. And the profile is probably where the Charger shows its age the most. It was updated in 2015. That was mostly front and rear fascia. The, the side profile has remained largely the same since, uh, when was the second generation Charger introduced? Someone in the comments help me out with that. Don't know off the top of my head, but for a number of years before the 2015 update. So the profile has stayed largely the same all that time. And you can see it, it's, it's a little old. But with the wide body kit, it freshens it, gives it new life, and is still a menacing side look. Coming around to the back, they redesigned the rocker panels as well to flow with the widened look of the car because it would just look strange if it was just fender flares, rocker panels went straight in. So they widened those as well. And now here at the back, see more of that width, this black lip spoiler is new for 2020 as well. It's got a matte finish to it. Subtle, but not too subtle. Not a tiny lip spoiler, but it's not a huge wing either. Enjoy that. These LED tail lights run the whole width of the tailgate, the trunk rather. Got Dodge spelled out in between. Another of the Scat Pack B badges. It's such a fun badge. It's really cool. And the yellow and the blue contrast nicely. And the red. Yellow, blue, and red. Typically wouldn't think those go together, but on this car they just do. And then more functional air channeling on the side. Breaks up the bodywork nicely. And then large circular exhaust in a black plastic diffuser. It's it. I would normally be up in arms about the plastic, but because it's designed, it's not just a piece of black plastic. 
It's got designs that accentuate the exhaust and one that kind of dips down to mirror the uptick to house the license plates. So it's artfully designed. It's not just a, a blank piece, piece of black plastic. Wow, that was really hard to say. It's not just a blank piece of black plastic. It has some character. So I will give it a pass. Like the rear end, and in my POV night drive, you can better see the LED light bar in the back. So we're gonna sum up my thoughts on the exterior. They are big old thumbs up. Yes, it's getting on in years, certainly, but the charger still looks so BA, and this wide body kit just amps it up a few more notches so that you're not gonna mistake it for a regular charger. You just can't. If you got the narrow body scat pack, maybe if you were just completely missing things, you could confuse it for the SXT or the GT, but not the wide body scat pack. This you're gonna know is more muscle. And certainly compared to other sedans in this space, it stands out. So I am very much in approval of the exterior design of the Scat Pack wide body. And that brings us to the interior. Let's head on in. And on our way in, I will mention that the Scat Pack comes with smart key access. So you can leave the key in your pocket and to unlock the doors, you just pull up on the handle to close and lock the doors. Just press this button up top, handy feature. And the interior of the Scat Pack wide body is a mixed bag but more favorable than unfavorable so to detail first that this model has a couple packages both of which i think are really smart buys one is the plus group for just under two thousand dollars that comes with so many goodies it stands as one of the most high value packages i've seen on a spec sheet and it's absolutely the one that you should check, check the box, and it will most likely be on most dealer lots when you're coming to check out these cars. Included in that plus group are things like these Alcantara inserts with the leather borders on the seats. You got that Scat Pack logo right there. Power front and pa front driver and passenger seats with memory function for both the seats and the mirrors this premium material for the dashboard with contrast stitching. If you don't get this, then it's hard plastic and just very unappealing. So definitely check the box for that. You get power tilt and telescoping for your steering wheel, ventilation for these front seats and heating for the rear seats with two different settings for each seat. You get a center armrest for these rear seats, which without would be kind of annoying. So again, an important package to choose. And then auto dimming for the rear view mirror. And if there's something I missed in that package, I apologize. But again, you can see it's a lot that you get for just under $2,000, so that's worth getting. This one also has the technology group, which brings with it uh, rain sensing windshield wipers, full speed adaptive cruise control, lane keeping assist, full speed auto emergency braking, and blind spot monitoring. No, blind spot monitoring actually is part of the, nope, I'm wrong. It's, yeah, it is. Wow, I'm correcting myself. Blind spot monitoring is with the plus group. I forgot that. But all the other things are part of the technology group. And uh, yeah, it's also very close to $2,000 and probably not as worth it as the plus group, but if you have a lot of time on the highway ahead of you, then it's probably worth it to get that adaptive cruise control by itself. This one also has a sunroof, just a sunroof, not a panoramic sunroof, just a sunroof. And they're charging $12.95 for that. And in contrast to the value of the plus group, $12.95 for just a standard sunroof seems a little ridiculous and yet without it it would be much darker inside this cabin so maybe you have to check it 
and hopefully dealers would have that box checked for you and you can negotiate. But yeah, sunroof for $12.95. Navigation system. Nav is part of this particular model here. Can't remember exactly what it costs. I will list it in the edit. And that about does it for the options on this car's interior. But as we can see, there is good and bad here. So you have the premium material up here on the upper door panel, and then you get into some nice leather insert for the doors and a leather armrest. And then we just step into some really cheap plastic. Like just the transition is rough. None of this premium material, just right into really hard cheap plastic for the window switches, for the mirrors, certainly for that piece right there. This is sort of a cheaper metal finish that will, it's not real metal, metal look that is certainly not gonna wear well. More of this cheap plastic all the way down here. So prepare for these to get scratched with your feet as you come in or whatever else. They will not wear all that well. And the premium material goes all the way down to here, but then when you get to your light switches, this turns into that cheaper plastic as well. Trunk release button there that actually raises the trunk the whole way, but does not lower. It is not a power lowering trunk. So you're gonna have to come over, close it yourself. You've got metal plates for your brake and accelerator and a truck style e-brake you gotta push that with your foot push it on you push it off that is pretty funny and it shows the age of this car that it still has that kind of e-brake no electric e-brake certainly no hand e-brake which i think would be cool on this car but no a truck style push e-brake now let's hop in and we can note the alpine sound system on the way in it's fine Sound system is fine. It's not amazing. I am not an audiophile, so I will not get into specifics of that, but it, it does the job. All right, now we can get into some other material quality things. So harder plastic for the wheel along with this chrome trim which will very soon be scratched with something and won't wear well guarantee it but that's going to be a few years hopefully before that looks garbage plastic pieces here for your controls for adaptive cruise control along with this metal finish this is more high quality than this chrome trim so that will wear better this leather wrapped steering wheel part of the scat pack and then the wide body makes it a flat bottom wheel more controls over here and pedals or paddles, sorry. Paddles for down and up shift. And boy, do I have a rant to make for this. So the paddles themselves are tiny, as you can see. They only stick up, you know, an inch over the steering wheel bar and probably are a full inch and a half, two inches. Then you have some controls here for your infotainment system. The fact that these paddles aren't any longer or any easier to access is frustrating because if you want to go into manual mode, you have to put two inches or your, your, your two fingers behind the paddles and use those. And you got to be right in the right spot or else you're not going to get a gear shift. So it just, I want more paddle. I want more paddle. And it's frustrating. Same deal on the right side. You got some controls back here below the paddle. Ease of use, sure, keeping your hands on the wheel, but I, I want more, more paddle on my performance sedan. Uh, so you get your B logo doing a little animation to start up the car. And then a big color, well, calm down AC, calm down. Big full color display in between some analog gauges. These are cool looking analog gauges, very muscle car-esque. Got some textured look in the center of the dials, red borders, and then this metal finish surrounding. So it's got some dimensionality to it. And in this TFT display, you can go through a bunch of different menus, including one that I'm just gonna jump to because you can see all this stuff that has your performance data. 
So you can slot through a bunch of different timers and gauges. I think there's a G-Force, yes, G-Force meter on here as well. So that's cool to have right in front of you. No head-up display, but some cool information right in front of the driver. The feel of the wheel is excellent. You've got some perforation at nine and three. Good size for the hand. And then we come over to some other finish here. So this has a touch of texture. Not much, but a little bit of texture that gives some depth and some difference to the trim. So you have that premium material going all the way across. You got your 392 badge yonder. Hard plastic down here with the glove box. Good sized glove box though. I mean, really generously sized glove box. But yeah, some texture for this metal look finish with the metal look border. So there are different colors and feels and looks that break up the dashboard a bit more than just blank piece. This is a higher quality plastic in here than what I'm gonna find right here which even though this is textured, this is super cheap. So the transition between the materials is rough sometimes, but this is still the premium material on the side, premium material and then hard plastic under the steering wheel and over, but premium start stop button right there. As I just showed a bit of a cubby in here for your smartphone, 12 volt DC socket there, right, dual zone auto climate control and some controls for your launch control. You have that as a quick access button, your drive modes, You've got a tuner and a volume knob, always important. This control wheel is for your climate control. Big meaty gear selector, just you put your whole hand on that and shift down like that. Uh, space for your key if you wanted to. I've just thrown it in the cup holder and this is what your key looks like. You've got your remote start here. You just tap that twice and the car will start up. Open of your trunk. Tap that twice and that will open. Just dodge on the other side. There's no red key for the scat pack. There's only one key, it's black key. So you're not gonna limit your horsepower. It's just what it is. More of this cool trim that's mimicked up here, down here. Leather wrapping for the base of the gear selector. That can be covered. And now what, we're looking at the cup holders. What do we do with cup holders and cup? Oh yeah, that's right. Large water bottle test. That's what time it is. So let's try out the cup holders. I don't have a good feeling about this. Yep. That's not going to fit. You want to leave it that way, but it's just going to sling back and forth. In the center console, you have this cheap pull-out thing for your coin storage and dust. That's not going to fit. It is not. How about the door pocket? Well, we got to get the door. Come here. That's a no-go. Not gonna fit in the door pocket. So we are striking out all around here. Ugh, last ditch effort, the glove box. It was big, but it had a divider in it. Oh, it's not gonna fit. Just not gonna fit anywhere. So a full-on fail. A large water bottle test for the Dodge Charger. Scat pack or otherwise. That's, oh man, really depressing stuff. Very depressing. But yes, you do have standard size cup holders. And then in the center console, as I already showed, it's that pull out. You've got two USB ports, not USB C, and one aux. But the rear passengers have two USB ports as well. So everyone's got a plug in. And now we arrive at the Uconnect system. And the Uconnect is several years old now, but it remains a very good infotainment because the software updates they keep introducing keep it fast and user-friendly. So you can control things here like your uh, ventilation for the front two seats, your seat heating. Uh, I have it already ventilated, that's neat. Uh, you've got a Wi-Fi hotspot. You've got your performance pages and SRT dashboard that I'll get to in a moment. You can control the climate control from in here. So these are all your apps. They're just different controls. They call them apps. Your media. You've got Sirius XM to start, and I don't know if it's a, tr I think it's a trial. 
your climate control, you can either use the touch points up here or use the physical controls. I would use physical controls, much easier. And then your individual seat settings up here. And uh, navigation, so I did mention this one has navigation as an option. The map is, uh, well, it's getting on in ears. I wouldn't pay extra for this navigation system, let's put it that way. It's fairly responsive and you can see what you're looking at pretty easily, but it's not cutting edge in terms of visuals or anything like that. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are standard. Then you've got your settings and that about does it, except for the performance pages. So let's go on over to performance pages. In here is nestled a lot of cool stuff. You can already see the smudges on the screen, by the way. It is 8.4 inches, the size of the screen. Just giving you fact while performance pages loads because it takes a while. So you've got some cool things like an active power and torque meter, some gauges, timers. So you can do drag timers or your acceleration braking. You do zero to 60, zero to 100 timers. Hopefully you're doing the zero to 100 in a safe spot. G-force meter, engine. You can see active readouts on your power and torque. That's cool, like the dyno. Dyno is just a different visual for that. You can see the little blips that we had. These are just really cool bits of data that you can actively look at while you're driving. Hopefully keeping your eyes mostly on the wheel. Maybe you're just checking them out when you're at the stoplight. And then we get into your drive modes. You've got auto, custom, sport, and track. Custom is exactly what it sounds. You can customize the setup for your transmission, whether you want the paddle shifters on or off, your traction control system, suspension, and steering. And it's cool that these are like toggles. So even though you don't have the physical feedback, it looks like they're toggles and that's cool. And then sport mode, that's kind of the one you're gonna leave it in most often, or at least I do, so you get that extra sound from the active exhaust system, but you don't have to go crazy with the track mode, which really is just for track. Unless you want a, sl you want a little bit of uh, slip from the, uh, from the traction control system, but you don't want too much, that's that. So those are all your settings for the Uconnect infotainment. I've shown you the front cabin setup. So let's hop into the rear and see what our space is like. Mm. One last thing I'll mention about this driver's seat position before I move on is that I find that First of all, the seats are extraordinarily comfortable. Really, really comfortable. It's like couch cushions, individual couch cushions. That's basically what we're working with here. So much padding. This would be a great road trip car because it's so comfortable. That point aside, I find that the seating position is a little too high for me. I want it to go down because if I'm sitting upright, my head is pretty close to this roof piece right here. That's me sitting all the way upright. If I'm kind of just like cruising a little bit, I've got space, it's not a big deal, but it's pretty darn close. So I wish I could lower the seat just a touch more. I am six feet tall for reference. And keep that in mind as I hop into the rear seat. So that's my driving position. We can just check out the trim materials, more of that premium up there, leather, leather, and then cheapy plastic. So, you know, at least mimicking the front cockpit and that's good. You've got a little cubby there for stuff. More of the Alcantara inserts with the leather borders back here. And then hopping in, we can see that I've got plenty of leg room. And there is a foot pocket in there so I can slide my legs out, stretch out a bit more. I really find that this rear seat cabin is, is very generous for passengers back here. Already so, showed you the rear seat heating and the USB ports. Yes, you have air vents. I would certainly hope you do have air vents on a $50,000 as tested car. Your center console or your armrest has some place for, I don't know what you would store in there. Good size cup holders, though not big enough for your large water bottle, I'm sorry. And what's your headroom situation like here? Acceptable. So this is, I'm sitting how the seat is angled. You can't adjust the seat angle at all, but I'm sitting out it's angled and I have headroom, headroom. Not a ton of it, that's glass up there, not a headliner, so you really wouldn't want to hear your head on that. But I have some headroom. Uh, the only thing I don't like about this backseat area is the, the pillar is just right here in my space. So when I close the door, 
Yeah, I've got window, but the pillar is just right there. So you look over, I'm staring right into the pillar. It's the only complaint for the back seat. Now let's look at the trunk. To open, you press this button here. And we find a 17 cubic feet of space trunk. So good size. And this cutout on either side means that you could take a set of golf clubs or two with you. And these seats fold down, though not with controls right here. No power or no manual controls to fold the seats down from here, which means you have to go back to the rear seats and find the fabric poles. Yes, they are fabric poles to make the seats go forward. And they don't go all the way flat. It's got a small angle to them. But when you fold those down, you can carry with you some longer items for your practicality. But the trunk itself is good size. You shouldn't have any problems carrying your normal air and run in here. And again, you'd have to manually close that. So that's the interior of the Charger Scat Pack. Some cheapness you can find, but certainly all the things you would need on a day-to-day -day basis for comfort and convenience. And definitely check the boxes for the Plus Group package, worth every penny. All right, let's go drive it. Oh, it's a good noise, isn't it? Naturally aspirated 6.4 liter Hemi V8 making 485 horsepower and 475 pound-feet of torque connected to a torque flight eight-speed automatic gearbox. Yes, it's a good motor. It's a very good motor. And in the hierarchy of charger engine options, you've got the Pentastar V6, you've got the 5.7 liter V8, then you've got this, then you've got the 6.2 liter Hellcat supercharged V8. I find this to be the best engine. Seriously, because to get that Hellcat motor, you've got to spend $20,000, at least more. And yes, it makes gobs of power. 717 horsepower is nothing to bat an eye at, but 485 isn't either. And this is really all usable power that you can have fun with on a daily basis because... My goodness, the fuel gauge. Just like actively dipping. The fuel economy is not great. 18 combined. But what I've been seeing is like 13 or 14. That's what you should expect as well because most of the time I'm not being too crazy with it. It's just really bad on gas. But it's what you get from a V8 muscle car. And this thing really just in the market is so unique. It is a dinosaur if you will. Just being a four-door muscle car being the last of that set but everything it does it does well it does well to modern standards because of the wide body kit and the tires and the brakes and the adaptive suspension the stiffer anti-roll bars front and rear that you get it can really handle like a sports car but then it has the muscle car elements you can line lock it so your rear tires are just gonna smoke or you can launch control it so you'll just blast off 0 to 60, 4.3 seconds. Top speed, 196 miles an hour. You can definitely blast off. So it does the muscle car things right, but then it does the sports car things right with very muscle car ideology. Yeah, wider tires, bigger brakes. That's how you, you handle better. And it works, it just works. It's not getting sophisticated with electric systems and all that jazz. It just does it the tried and true ways and they work. Then you get into how livable is it? How, how daily drivable? And the answer is supremely. I've already talked about these seats and how comfortable they are. They're comfortable when you're throwing yourself back in them, accelerating with the G-force and they're comfortable just cruising around. They just hold you in place. They're just big couch cushions. They're wonderful. And the visibility in here is excellent. You don't have any of those swoopy roof lines like the coupe design sedan, so you don't have a huge blind spot in the C-pillar. It just, it knows 
how to do the sedan formula right, how to be a daily driver. And then the road noise. I'm at highway speeds right now, doing 65. It's relatively quiet in here. This, the cabin insulation is excellent, despite the fact you've got these big old tires and they're performance tires, the cabin volume is not bad at all. And you've got those things, those add-ons that you want, the adaptive cruise control and the lane keeping assist, you can add all those things on if you need to. And it really becomes very convenient for your commute. But back to the performance, because that's what this is, that's what it does. It's so good. It handles itself so well and predictably in a corner. And then a second later, you turn off the traction control and you do something dumb. Like slide it. It just does it. It just does it. It does whatever you want it to do. Whenever you want it to do. And then it becomes very easy to drive. A second later, you take it out of sport mode, you put it in auto, and you're just cruising casually, comfortably. I love this thing. I love it so, so much. But we gotta frame, we gotta frame it with the competitors. So we've got the Kia Stinger GT and the Cadillac CT5V. What was the Cadillac CT6 V Sport, now the CT5V. The Stinger GT starts at $40,000. So the Scat Pack starts at just over $40,000. And the Stinger GT is a 3.3 liter twin turbo V6, making 365 horsepower. So certainly way off the power mark for this. Zero to 60 for that is five seconds. So way off the zero to 60 time of this. The design language outside and in is very, very good. And that's probably what is going to tip the scales for some people in the Stinger GT's favor, but I like the brashness of this design, so it wouldn't edge me out. And then there's the CT5V, which is becoming more and more European in its design and its offering of the interior and all that. And it's, it's good, it's very good. But that also has a twin turbo V6 and also makes 360 horsepower, so way less and the 0 to 60 is 4.6 for that, so still way off the mark for this Charger Scat Pack. And that just means that they really can't make the argument, certainly from a performance standpoint, and I would say largely from a comfort and convenience standpoint, maybe those things have like wireless smartphone charging in the Cadillac and uh, what else, USB-C ports, but those are small things and a panoramic sunroof, fine. Those are small things in your enjoyment of a vehicle on a daily basis. And that means that at $40,000 for the Scat Pack narrow body, and then 46 for the wide body, yeah, six grand is a lot, but you're getting a lot. All those performance details that I mentioned, you just get so much for your money in this car. And as tested, this one's 56, but I swear to you, that you go to a dealership and Dodge will be making deals on these things. You could walk out the door, taxes and everything, for 50000 in the car I'm driving right now. And for that money, you're getting so much car. So, so much car. Daily drivable comfort. The badass looks. Just, it's, and the performance. The performance is there in spades. So you're getting a lot of car for your money and more so, I think, than you can argue in both of the competitors I mentioned. And it's, it's really just a last hurrah for the muscle car with four doors because this car is going to convert into an Alfa Romeo Giulia platform-based sedan. It's going to target the European cars and it's just gonna transform from what it is and lose some enthusiasm from certain fans in the process, myself included, but until then, just enjoy it for what it is, which is nuts. Nuts. I've got cars in front of me. They're going. It's just nuts what this thing does. Tires are so good. I, I'm astonished at what it's doing at this roundabout right now. That was fast, guys. That was really fast, and it just does it.